<coughs> Thank you, Inésef, for your invitation, because it's my second visit to Riga at the School of Law, and so I'm, I'm happy of coming again. And, and fina finally, I'm, I'm the last, so we'll finish soon. Uh, <coughs> watching the title of my paper, <coughs> Consumer Lending Litigation in Spain, I have to, to make a remark because, in fact, my, intervent my intervention will be more about the Directive on Affair Contract Terms and its application by the European Court of Justice and concretely by the Spanish Supreme Court. Well, <coughs> I'm not going to explain uh, nothing new to you about the directive, about uh, the, the first steps, but a few years ago, someone said that this directive was, ref was like uh, a sleeping beauty. A sleeping beauty who had just revived it, because now, after almost 18 years, we have uh, about 50, 55 uh, judgments uh, regarding this directive. So now the beauty is wide and is, is wide awake, alive and well, and there is not any sign of it falling asleep uh, in the next future. But I have to say that this directive is a result of a compromise, a big compromise and sometimes a little bit difficult compromise. Only a small example, for example, the question regarding the notion of unfair term. Uh, the French-German alliance uh, defended the idea of the principle of good faith, an objective good faith, but the Anglo-Saxon approach introduced this notion of imbalance. And there are others, other, other questions regarding this directive. But the fact is uh, Spanish litigation regarding, uh, regarding uh <coughs> a loading contracts has been quite uh, affected by this directive and its application. Because after the start of the Great Recession in Spain in 2008-2009, most of judgments were about some financial products, complex financial products, swaps, for example, and others like that. But uh, a little bit later, most of cases uh, concentrated on uh, mortgage loans. Especially after the European Court of Justice judgment uh, assist case in 2013 uh, regarding one Spanish case uh, with other uh, implications about procedural law, etc. But after this uh, European judgment, the Spanish Supreme Court issued a judgment of uh, 9 uh, May 2013 regarding these mortgage loans with a concrete clause is the so-called floor clause. Floor clause uh, because uh, <coughs> the banks introduced this clause to avoid the, uh, mm, the reduce of uh <coughs> the, of the, the to, to, to avoid the impact of a reward decrease on the interest rate fixed uh, in this in these loans. So it means that in many cases, consumers ha had concluded these mortgage loans, uh, ignoring the existence, or at least theoretically ignoring the existence of this clause. So, uh, after the, the decrease of the Euribor, they believe that they, uh, they, won't, uh, they, they will pay less in, in the loans, but it wasn't the opposite. Uh, they were obliged to pay uh, to some rate and, well, reading the, the clause, uh, no problem. But <coughs> I have to say that, uh, I said theoretically, in many cases, mm, probably the consumers, they didn't ignore the floor clause. Probably they didn't understand it well, but they didn't ignore it because at this time, when they concluded this contract, they were only worried about the quantity of the loan. At this time, in this uh, situation, Spanish banks, they were quite interested in uh, promoting and stimulating credit in, in Spain, especially for uh, buying uh, real estate. Maybe uh, someone, for example, in Brussels could imagine that Spaniards are uh, uh, in love with real estate, or there are some uh, ADN reasons in our country to justify this uh, 
interest for real estate. But no, it isn't. Of course, there, there were at this time some legal reasons uh, regarding tax law, but also mm, other most, mm, more important reasons, I think, connected with our economic history. And it's important to say it because now, after the crisis and with a different uh, economic development, the situation has changed a little bit, but it has started to change. And now, for example, we can watch in Germany with other situation the new interest for a lot of uh, for a lot of Germans for acquiring real property, uh, immobile property, etc. But in Spain, in the 60s and in the 70s, with the development of our economy, well, uh, citizens they didn't have uh, a lot of assets for their money, and uh, an economic growth with a uh, relatively high inflation explains this interest for real estate, at least for one or two generations. And, and now the, the results in this, uh, in this uh, monetary union with uh, cheap credit, with, uh, a lot with many possibilities to, to get uh, uh, a good contract, uh, a good credit contract, well, explains a little bit this, this, this situation. So <coughs> the Spanish Supreme Court, uh, in this judgment of 2013, first was obliged to say if this term was unfair or not. And uh, the Supreme Court uh, made some statements. First of all, uh, it said that at least in, a, in an abstract uh, plan, in an abstract perspective, the, um, the floor clause could be fair, but it depends on the circumstances uh, around the contract. About this, I have to say that sometimes in the European Union we can, uh, we can see some mistakes made by the European Court of Justice, by people working in the European Commission, etc. Because, for example, in the judgment Gutierrez Naranjo and others, the general advocate is about the retroactivity or not retroactivity of this declaration of nullity of the f uh, floor clause <coughs> in this judgment of 2013. Well, in, in Gutierrez Naranjo and others, the European Court of, the, sorry, the, the Advocate General said literally that, that after this Spanish judgment of 2013, all floor clauses included in contract of this type will be ball, uh, null and void. But it isn't true. It isn't true. The Spanish Supreme Court only said that, first of all, the floor clause is fair. But depending on circumstances, we can discuss <coughs> the uh, legality of this clause. So it's uh, necessary to prove the unfairness of this floor clause. <coughs> uh, so the, the Spanish Supreme Court uh, state that uh, it's necessary to take into account the concrete circumstances uh, at the conclusion of the contract. And it uses it use, uh, the recital uh, number 20 of the directive and also article uh, paragraph 2 of, of this directive. Because, you know, <coughs> the floor clause affects the interest rate. And the question is, if the interest to be paid by the debtor is a part of the main subject of the contract. Article uh, 4, paragraph 2 says that uh, it could not be uh, affected by this judgment of unfairness, fairness of unfairness. But, uh, well, the Spanish Supreme Court used one, a contrario, a contrario sense of interpretation because in this paragraph, in the end, says of the directive, I mean, if uh, the, these terms are in a plain, intelligible, intelligible language. So, the unfair nature of the terms shall relate neither to the definition of the main subject matter of the contract, but at last, if these terms are in plain, intelligible language. So, if these terms are not in plain, intelligible language, we can try to control these kind of terms. <coughs> But this first uh, Supreme Court judgment didn't explain many other things because the conditions of this floor clause <laughs> were quite uh, limited. I mean, 
it was it wasn't it wasn't possible to use this statement for other clauses, uh, expiry dates uh, in advance, for example, or uh, mortgage loans concluded in foreign currency. It's quite similar. It's quite common in, in Spain this this type of of mortgage uh, contract. It's true that uh, that uh, the the Supreme Court ex ex uh, speaks of real comprehension of the importance of non-negotiated clauses in the reasonable development of the contract, but not much more. Other uh, arguable question of this uh, decision from our Supreme Court was that to avoid the economic effects of this statement, the Spanish Supreme Court states uh, that this uh, declaration of unfairness, if it existed, wouldn't affect the contract concluded before this, this judgment. So the so-called non-retroactivity of unfairness uh, stated by the, by the judgment. Well, this uh, approach was highly criticized by, by, by lawyers in Spain because if the consequence of being unfair is to be uh, null and void, uh, the nullity implies uh, um, ex tunc effect and not ex nunc, at least in most of legal systems. Well, uh, we were obliged to, to wait for this <coughs> Gutierrez and Anjo and others judgment from the European Court of Justice uh, to see that uh, the European Court of Justice declared this retroactivity of the of the of the nullity of unfair terms in this kind of contract. <coughs> but this uh, idea of uh, nullity is only a part or is a characteristic of the so-called uh, transparency requirement of this directive. Transparency requirement, uh, which has been uh, declared by the European Court of Justice in Kassler and Kasslerner Kassler Rabbi case, and follow it then by other cases uh, as such as Matei, Van Hove, or for example, Bukura. Uh, I would like to say that uh, there is another judgment from the European Court of Justice, Andrisiut, Andrisiuk and others, probably continuing this trend of the European Court of Justice, which the court <coughs> apply the new standard, the new standard of unfairness, to a loan agreement concluded in a, concluded in a foreign currency. <coughs> the ruling, this last ruling, doesn't make a big, a big change, but at least it clarifies some things and goes further than Kassler and Kasslerne Rabai case. Because uh, according to Kasslerne case, uh, the contract should set out transparently exactly how the mechanism of conversion for the foreign currency shall operate. Uh, but, for example, and this your case in concretely in the text of, of this judgment, well, says that the consumer must be in a position to know the economic consequences of binding himself. Whether the terms fulfill this standard is to be analyzed in the light of all the relevant facts, including the promotional material and the information supplied by the business during the negotiation. This, analy this analysis is made taking into account an average consumer, a uh, reasonable, well-informed and reasonable ob um, observant and circus pet one. Well, this is the typical motto or typical classical expression coming, f coming from the from the European Court of Justice. Of justice, uh, in in French they have some expression for this kind of language. They say langue de bois, so it's uh, a wooden language, because after so many judgments regarding this directive, it's absolutely horrible to repeat all the expressions because all the judgment is repeating and repeating and repeating the, the previous judgment f uh, from the court. And I would like to say that, of course, it's arguable, this idea of a medium notion of consumer, well-informed, etc., because there are uh, two things to clarify. First is this previous idea of uh, the consumer uh, 
he has uh, never enough inf information enough to <coughs> to balance the situation with the entrepreneur of the of the of the company and it depends and the other is at least we have one example with the directive on unfair commercial practices of a little bit more flexible notion of consumer because especially because uh, for uh, for illegal uh, advertising and other types of advertising uh, the directive is speaking of some uh, vulnerable consumer according to the age or other personal circumstances well but this is the the, the tendency of the of of the court uh <coughs> about about this and this look, uh, I have to, to mention uh, other things because uh, after this and this case, the Spanish Supreme Court state a new judgment in the, at the end of uh, 2017, in, in November uh, 2017, uh, regarding some contracts, uh, loan contracts concluded in foreign currency. And the Spanish Supreme Court uh, goes also further than the European Court of Justice to explain all the things and to clarify some uh, some situation, because, uh, for example, uh, repeating the criteria established by Andrzejuk and others' uh, judgment, the Spanish Supreme Court recalls that the transparency requirement cannot be limited to a formal and grammatical intelligibility, but be broader. Uh, at the same time. The Supreme Court blames the lender for not explaining appropriately the fluctuation of the currencies. In particular, according to the Spanish court, the bank should have informed the consumer not only that the fluctuation may render performing the obligation more costly, but also that it may, it may make performance so much more costly, as even to put in risk the ability to repay the loan. But at the same time, the Spanish Supreme Court makes a mistake about the notion or the, the, the mechanism of these loan contracts concluded in foreign currencies. Because um, it said literally that the fluctuation of the currencies means a constant, constant recalculation of the borrowed capital. But it's not true. It's not true. The consequence is you have to pay more or less according to the fluctuation, but it's not a recalculation, uh, a constant recalculation, because it's the same mechanism for, for all the life of the contract. So it's, it's, it's different. Uh, it means that the, 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 the bank doesn't have to tell the consumer that the fluctuation of the currencies implies a recalculation of the borrowed capital, but to inform him about the uh, fact that fluctuations make, make reimbursing the loan very costly or much more costly than initially expected. And, and, and that's all, because uh, in, in this case uh, <coughs> of the Spanish Supreme Court, the problem, like in many others, was finally the consumer was obliged to pay much more than uh, than the initial, initially, uh, initially uh, contracted uh, with the bank. On the other hand, we have other questions about this uh, judgment because with our consumer legislation and because of the worries of our legislator, mm, the parliament introduced some uh, uh, duties for, for example, public notaries. Yeah. Well, it's only about this question of the, the intervention of a public notary is not enough to protect consumer interest. So it means that the reading of this contract is not enough to protect the interest of the consumers. Or even, for example, the signature by the consumer saying that he knows the content of the contract is not enough. The Supreme Court declared it ineffective. And the last point, only in, in two minutes, is to say that it's curious that all this situation of litigation in Spain is for protection consumers. So it's about consumer loans uh, or consumer contract. But we have some, uh, some, some recent examples about the, uh, the extension of the protection regarding contracts, contracts concluded by uh, entrepreneurs or professionals. Because our legislation on general condition of contract, at least theoretically, 
it has the possibility of controlling unfair terms in professional or entrepreneur uh, contracting system. So it means that our Supreme Court has recently declared that if the contractor is the debtor, is a professional, for example, a legal person, a society. So he has not the condition of consumer, and he has no possibility of using consumer uh, protection legislation, at least because of our act on general condition of contract, uh, allows this possibility, but without establishing a, a content control, well, we can use the principle of good faith, principle of good faith saying that because it's an objective good faith, we can prove, if it's possible, we can try to prove the, um, uh, the um, fulfillment of the expectations from the parties. So in general terms, because, for example, I have to say that no, we don't have any examples about unfair terms in these in this, in this, in this cases, except for transport contract and, for example, about other financial contracts between companies. But the, the, the result is, finally, the protection for the entrepreneurs in some cases of these loans will be quite similar to consumer protection because with this principle of good faith and this idea of expectations coming from the contract concluded by the parties, we can use uh, the same notion of, of uh, imbalance between the parties in the contract. Maybe referring this imbalance to uh, the, 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 uh, well, the, the, the way of contracting in some concrete sector uh, because it, it could be quite different in, on in, in one than in another one. Well, and this is all for, for, for my paper according to the instructions by the, by the organizer. So thank you very much for your attention.